and uh, it's slowed down a little bit because of the recession, but it's going to pick up as the, the cost of a barrel of oil gets to that threshold level, which it's hovering at right now, and, and will almost certainly go beyond, at, at which point it's going to accelerate. And the curve is going to go you know, quite, quite steeply. And what I'm seeing is there are a lot of gray areas. Uh, I, I believe that, that given this huge economic incentive to Alberta, that the resources should be made available uh, because it will be worth it in the long run. It will be a good investment in the future to do the science and to make sure that the science is, is transparent, that it's open to the public, that it's not funded by industry, uh, that, it's, uh, that it's independently, that there's independent oversight, that there's proper peer review, and that the policies that come out of it um, are, are, are the policies that are enacted, the regulations that are enacted, are based on science, uh, based on, on proper studies. Not oil company studies, because they'll, they'll bring in studies this thick that they're happy to pay for because it makes a good prop on the table at a, at a hearing or at a press conference like this. But independent, independent science. Uh, and I, I think that you know, the world is looking at what you uh, here in, in Alberta do. And uh, the decisions that, that, uh, that are made here are really going to shape the energy policy of the future. Of course, our ener you know, the energy policy where I live in the, in the United States is, is, uh, is uh, you know, it's brain dead just slowly coming out of a coma right, right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 right down there we're, you know, we're looking at a, at a uh, government system that's relatively paralyzed when it comes to energy. They can't even use the term, and I've, I've heard this directly from the mouths of, of senators who are trying to introduce energy legislation, that they can't even use the term, they can't even use the term climate change. So, you know, I, I say all this as, as by way of preamble to what's really the key issue before us here today, which is the impact on, on, uh, on the First Nations communities and on the, on the, the uh, natural habitats of, of Alberta on which they survive to some extent with their traditional hunting and, and fishing, and it's a part of their diet. And there have been, um, you know, certainly there's a, there's the, uh, a lot of evidence uh, and George uh, uh, Poitra brought it to my attention when uh, when we met at the uh, when I was in New York for the the uh, UN Permanent Forum on on Indigenous Issues. George came to me and and Francois who did the invocation, um, and um, uh, they they told me this story of what's uh, what's happening in in Fort Chippewan, and uh, I uh, when I when I met with um, Premier Stelmach today. Uh, he he uh, um, gave the floor to his uh, um, minister of environment, or sorry, minister of health, to to uh, in a sense kind of re rebut the, this claim. And they had a study, of course, and uh, I, I find that I find that inconclusive, simply because the the people in Fort Chippewan are afraid to drink their own water. They're afraid to to uh, eat the fish. Uh, they're afraid of the river. They're afraid to let their kids swim in the river. I grew up swimming in a river in, uh, in the, on the Niagara Peninsula. That's where my love of water came from that later translated into you know, all of my activities as, a, as an ocean explorer and so on. I can't imagine being told by my mom that I can't swim in the river. That's, that, that the idea of that is appalling to me. And for a community to live in fear like that, um, it, we, we need to, to look into this. We need, we need uh, uh, funding to do a, a study, an impartial study, uh, and to either uh, and to, to verify or not verify that there is a causal link uh, between uh, contaminants in the Athabasca River and what's happening in, in Fort Chippewan. And maybe it's not in the water. Maybe it's in the maybe it's in the fish. Maybe it can't be measured in the water. You know, I had a, a meeting with Dr. David Schindler, who's been a leading uh, um, you know kind of opponent. Of the uh, of the science that's been done, that's been funded by by the uh, by industry, such as the RAMP program, the Regional Aquatic Monitoring Program, uh, and you know he's been highly critical of their of their science methodology and and their obsolete instrumentation. Uh, you know he uses a gas chromatograph mass mass spectrometer uh, approach, and uh, he explained to me he went through in in uh, in great detail how he gathers his data, and he showed me where where their data clips off and how his data goes to a much deeper level. And uh, he's, he's shown that there are, in fact, contaminants that are related to, to uh, 
uh, you know, the hydrocarbons one would expect from the tar sands. Of course, the, the, the counterpunch to that is that people say, well, it's always been leaching out of these exposed embankments. Um, but, you know, I think we need to respect the First, First Nations communities for having their finger on the pulse of what's happening to Mother Nature. And if they say the, face, the, the fish taste different and they're being affected and something's going on, I think it would behoove us to listen to that and find out for sure what these what these causal links are, because you know, uh, uh, Dr. Schindler showed me pictures of of uh, fish that are being caught in ever greater numbers that have tumors on their bodies that are discolored that have uh, that have uh, bruising and deformations, and this is not normal. Uh, and you know, there, there's not a lot of of data on the baseline back before all the mining started and before the tailings ponds were created, unfortunately, and the instrumentation wasn't as good back in the, uh, in the 70s and the 80s, but he was able to, uh, to show me a, a, a fish survey that was done back at that time in which there, you know, thousands and thousands of, of fish were caught and studied and there were no reports of deformities. And yet they're showing up now with greater and greater frequency. So this, uh, this all needs to be, to be looked at very, very carefully. Uh, uh, you know, I think it's impossible to, to imagine um, a, a refining process and an extraction process on this scale that did not have negative environmental impacts. Uh, it, it, I mean, that would, that would have to be some kind of immaculate conception. So it's important for us to embrace the fact that there will be negative impacts, they need to be understood, and they need to be mitigated at the source to the extent possible. Now, you know, what does that mean? Well, we've got to, we, you know, we've got to slap slap, uh, you know, regulatory control on the amount of sulfur dioxide emissions and so on coming out of these, these plants, uh, the, the CO2 emissions and so on. We've got to look at the, at the tailings ponds and, and uh, look at that very carefully. And, uh, I, you know, I would, I would suggest seri seriously considering a moratorium on future tailings ponds until that's understood until that's understood better, because there are alternatives. There are technologies that are on the horizon to do it without tailings ponds, to do uh, a dry fines, dry fines process. It's still in the laboratory. They say it's, it's uh, five years from being uh, scalable in the field. Okay, we're talking about something that's gonna have hundreds of years of impact. Let's wait five years. Let's get the answer. Uh, let's 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 know more. I think this is reasonable. This is the this is the precautionary principle. Uh, of course, we we need energy and we're hungry for it. Uh, I think the the uh, the SAG D process that was mentioned earlier um, looks like it has promise. But the only the, only, the in, in terms of the less of a footprint in terms of disturbing disturbing the surface habitat. But you know what do you get with that? You're putting in almost as much energy into getting into the extraction process as you're getting out when you burn it, burn it at the automobile later. Uh, so you know that that needs that's a that's a brand new technology. It's 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 only 15 years from the lab to some of the first operating plants now. You know I saw the plants. I walked. I, I talked to the engineers. I think I understand how it works. It's fascinating. But but uh, you know uh, my my suggestion to the oil industry would be. Look at a way to have the, the energy going into that system be from a renewable source, as opposed to just burning natural gas, or uh, or some other way of generating the, the steam. I think that would go a long way toward toward giving the public some comfort that this is being really thought through on a long-term basis. Now, whether you agree with with the idea that that climate change is is anthropogenic or not, it doesn't matter because I know it is, and uh, the science community knows it is. To a 90, 98 uh, uh, percent of them, uh, believe that to be true very strongly, and that that is going to come home to roost no matter what the deniers say at some point, and it's going to happen sooner than later. Uh, it's going to be five to ten years before it's an absolutely incontrovertible, and we're living within the symptoms of that on a daily basis. So, what's the future proofing? What's the future proofing of the plan, the, the, the land use and development plan for Albertans? What's the future proofing for the oil, the oil companies? They need, to have, they need to have, be incentivized if they're not currently to do the right thing going forward and to use the best practices and the best technology. Uh, and I think the, the, uh, the federal and provincial government needs to play a very strong role in that because they're not going to do it themselves. I've been, I've been around the third world lately, uh, you know, the so-called third world, uh, you know, as a as a guest of other um, indigenous leaders who have their own problems with extraction industries and with energy industries. 